Hello and welcome. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events here at the Mechanics Institute in San Francisco. Thank you for joining us for our online program, Young Bloomsbury, the generation that redefined love, freedom, and self-expression in 1920s England with author Nino Stracci in conversation with San Francisco State University Professor Loretta Steck. We are very proud to co-sponsor this event with the Fromm Institute for Lifelong Learning. If you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, and ongoing author and literary programs, and on Friday night, our Cinema Lit Film series. So please see our website, milibrary.org, to see all of our events and offerings. Also, if you're here in San Francisco, please join us for free tours of our beautiful Beaux-Arts building and library and chess room on Wednesdays at noon. Our program today will be followed by a Q&A with you, our audience, and we will ask you to put your questions in the Q&A or the chat. And please purchase a book through your nearest independent bookstore. Keep the bookstores alive. This is an incredible book. Of course, we know so much about Virginia Woolf, E.M. Forster, and Lytton Strachey, but today we'll have a window on the next generation of writers and artists, and also of the political and social climate of London and England during this time, and how both the younger and the older generation of artists influenced each other. I'm very pleased to welcome our two guests. Nino Stracci is the last member of the Stracci family to have grown up in Sutton Court in Somerset, home of the, of the, for the family for more than 300 years. After studying at Oxford University and Corthold Institute, Nino worked as a curator for the National Trust and English Heritage. She is also the author of Rooms of Their Own, and she lives in West London with her family. And Loretta Steck is professor in the English Department of San Francisco State University, where she teaches courses on modernist literature with a focus on women writers, animal studies and literature, Southern African literature in English, and literature of exile and migration. One of her favorite courses to teach is an intensive study of Virginia Woolf's works. She has published articles on Wolf, Gertrude Stein, Juna Barnes, D.H. Lawrence, Bessie Head, and other 20th century writers. So I'm so pleased to welcome our very special honored guests. And I will turn this program over to Professor Steck to uh, introduce the program. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and welcome to everyone. I am very honored to be here to speak with Nino Strachey about her wonderful book. I would like to say just a few words about old Bloomsbury before we get to young Bloomsbury in, in a moment, just to sort of remind us of the history behind the history. And in thinking about how Bloomsbury came to be known as Bloomsbury, I almost always think about a passage in Virginia Woolf's diary that she wrote in 1928, where we, she was reflecting on her father, Leslie Stephen. Her father, Leslie Stephen, had died in 1904, and in 1928, she was writing in her diary on, the, on his birthday, on the day that would have been his, his birthday. And she writes, um, that he, he might have lived many more years than he did, but mercifully he did not. And this is, a, this is a quotation from that entry. She says, his life would have entirely ended mine. What would have happened? No writing, no books, inconceivable. 
Now that may seem like a bit of a harsh judgment on the part of a daughter thinking about her father's passing, but I think that um, what is enmeshed in that comment is the sense that her father's death allowed for many changes in the Stephen family and his passing was in some sense symbolic of the passing of the Victorian era. And the Victorian era really needed to make way for the new changes of the 20th century and the, the radical experimentation that the Bloomsbury group, including his children, helped to create. So when Leslie Stephen passed in 1904, Virginia Woolf's sister Vanessa packed up the old, dark, claustrophobic, claustrophobic family house in Hyde Park Gate. And she moved with her siblings to 46 Gordon Square in the Bloomsbury neighborhood of London. And it was here that the Stephen children began to host their Thursday evenings where intellectual conversation took place among many guests, many types of guests, but many of the, the core members of those conversations had been friends at Cambridge University. And in a reflection about that era, Virginia Woolf writes, we were full of experiments and reforms. We were going to do without table napkins. We were going to paint, to write, to have coffee after dinner instead of tea. Everything was going to be new. Everything was going to be different. Everything was on trial. And that everything, of course, included sexual relationships, gender identities, as well as artistic and aesthetic experiments. Um, Bloomsbury evolved over the years in, in different directions, but those core values of creativity, philosophical discussion, and sexual experimentation really persisted through, through the decades. And just to list a few of the members who would be considered kind of core Bloomsbury group members, um, here they are. Um, Virginia Woolf, of course, the writers, Virginia Woolf, Lytton Strachey, and E.M. Forster, the political thinker and writer, Leonard Woolf, the visual artists, Duncan Grant, Vanessa Bell, Dora Carrington, the economist, Maynard Keynes, the art critics, Clive Bell and Roger Fry. And there were many others who were more loosely associated with that core group of friends. So I'm so delighted to be here to speak with Nino about her book, about the next generation, about the younger group that found a kind of elective family, a kind of home with this older generation of Bloomsbury figures. So Nino, I'd like to ask you to just talk with us a little bit about how your family was connected to the Bloomsbury group and how you came to this project about the younger generation. Okay, so, well, thank you very much, Loretta, for that wonderful introduction to that, the world of old Bloomsbury. Um, and I think it, it's fair to say that I had always grown up knowing that my family, the Strachey family were intimately associated with Bloomsbury. Um, and at one point, I think it was fair to say that there were more Strachey's resident in Bloomsbury than any other family amidst the Bloomsbury group. Because uh, at one point in Gordon Square, you had Lytton Strachey, his mother and two sisters at number 51. You had his brother Oliver and his daughter Julia at number 42. And you had his brother James Strachey, who was the first English translator of Freud and his wife, Alex Strachey, living at number 41. So you had like a row of Strachey's in the core uh, row in Bloomsbury. And so they were a really dominant presence. Um, so I, again, it's fair to say I knew about that history. I knew about the history of, of writing and involvement in psychoanalysis uh, and involvement also the female members campaigning for women's suffrage. Um, but although um, I'd worked as a, a curator and researcher for the National Trust and English Heritage, it'd be fair to say I hadn't done any personal research into Straight Cheese and Bloomsbury until the mid 2000s. Um, and then one day one of my colleagues rang me up uh, to say that they'd found a box of Straight Cheese papers at Knoll in Kent. 
And Knoll was the childhood home of Vita Sapfa West, uh, the inspiration for Wolf's Orlando, um, and also of her first cousin, the heir to Knoll, Eddie Sapfa West. Um, and until that point, I simply hadn't known that Eddie Sapfa West had lived in London with my cousin, John Strachey, in the 1920s. Uh, and the two of them, they were born around 1900, so they were 20 years younger than the older, the pre-war generation of Bloomsbury. Um, but in the 1920s, they had formed close and intimate relationships with those, in John's case, older relations, in Eddie case, Eddie's case, older friends. And when they'd moved out of their flat in London in 1926, they had simply pushed all the papers into a box, and nobody had really looked at it since then and it was not just papers there were objects there was even a, a patent chest expander that Eddie had used to <laughs> stretch his muscles um, and so there were letters there were plays they were both wanting to be great writers so they'd been sending off articles to magazines mostly being turned down they'd written plays all of this stuff and it suddenly you were catapulted into the world of Bloomsbury in the 20s and that, again, was a world I didn't know much about. And I looked in and it, what was revealed in these letters was extraordinary sense of, of candor about relationships, uh, queer and straight, about um, conversations regarding gender, conversations regarding literature, art, everything. And it was such a wonderful source that led me into writing my first book, Rooms of Their Own, looking at the interiors created by Eddie, by Virginia and by Vita. But there was much more to be said uh, because there was a, a much broader canvas. And that is what I've been writing about in Young Bloomsbury. And I think it'd be fair to say that I began uh, the research looking, thinking about the, the probably the literary and artistic influence of this younger generation on the older. So very much thinking of that cultural influence. But as I went more in depth into the research, I looked much more at the social influence and this incredible beneficial relationship of uh, old Bloomsbury, who we would describe today as a family of choice or a chosen family, a group of queer friends and allies who had come together through choice. And now they were nurturing a new generation of queer young creatives uh, who were experimenting both with sexual and gender identities and helping them to be the people they wanted to be, they'd be the writers and artists and performers that they wanted to be. Um, and this was at a, quite a difficult time in the UK. We probably think of the twenties, you know, the jazz age, we am thinking about nightclubs and fancy dress and dancing. But in the UK, the mid twenties, there was a very um, repressive conservative government in place with a Home Secretary who was cracking down on what he described as public indecency. He didn't like nightclubs. He didn't like this new mood of, of you know, freedom and dancing. So it was a period of actually strangely constrictive political uh, feelings. And so here were a lucky group of queer young creative people who found a group of supportive adults to help them develop. Uh, and some of the people include the sculptor, Stephen Tomlin, who carved the long-standing images of Virginia Woolf, of Lytton Strachey, of Duncan Grant. You have artists um, like uh, Stephen Tennant, who worked with Cecil Beaton to create some of the most iconic images of the 20s, any, many of which were uniquely expressive of trans and non-binary identities. Uh, and you have writers like Julia Strachey, who was uh, very much supported by Virginia Woolf and, and wrote Cheerful Weather for the Weddings. So I hope that gives a little bit about why I wrote the book and some of the areas it covers. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we are now in a moment of backlash in this country. We have in Florida, the, the Don't Say Gay Bill. We have anti-trans legislation across the nation. We have uh, um, drag queen story hour being attacked in various libraries. So um, I wondered if you wanted to say more about how you feel telling this story of the young Bloomsbury generation um, is important now. I think it's very important and I'm very delighted that this book is arriving in the United States now, but could you speak a little bit about what your aspirations are for the kind of impact it might have in this moment? I think what it was 
wonderful for me about the book was the opportunity to celebrate the value of acceptance. Uh, here was a group of people of admired writers and artists uh, who were uniquely supportive in every way. They believed that people had the right to live and love in the way they chose. And this is over a hundred years ago. And surely we can learn by example. Um, I think it was just, it's so, well, it was so empowering for me to read about the way that they were uh, open to, as I say, to every form of sexuality, every form of gender expression, and to also to, to read about the way they described it. I mean, Virginia Woolf, of course, is, is uniquely evocative. She gives a amazing descriptions of a, a, par a party, for example, that she co-hosted in 1925, um, where she had deliberately invited a group of young men from Oxford University to entertain Lytton Strachey and how he went booming and humming from flower to flower, um, and how she'd invited Stephen Tomlin, the sculptor, bisexual, and how he had approaches from every person there, more or less, and sat for hours on the sofa talking to her sister, Vanessa Bell, and then when the music began, um, Virginia had invited everyone to come in in white tie and tails, as it was a you know, smart party. Uh, and she says that all the young men began waltzing around the room in each other's arms and all the young women sat flirting with each other in corners. Uh, and there's just such a lovely vision of queer contentment. Uh, and I, I love the way that Virginia played such a nurturing and motherly role to this, this group uh, of, of queer young people nurturing their artistic endeavors. So she employed young writers at the Hogarth Press. Uh, she sponsored um, their works and she was in, inspired uh, by them. Um, and so for example, Eddie Sackville West, Vita's young cousin, um, she encouraged his writing. Um, she supported him in discussing his relationship. She even asked him to bring his diary around her so they could read it together um, and she could help him work through uh, these uh, relationships. And, and Lytton Strait, she played a, an equally supportive role, again, for a whole a wide group of young men and women entertaining them at his home at Ham Spray, encouraging them to carry out performances which explored different types of, of gender expression. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's just it, it feels like we can um, we can learn so much um, from the generation that has gone before. And it was particularly lovely for me, I think, as as a mother of a, a child who identifies as queer and gender fluid, to be able to think about the the positive queer role models with our own family. Uh, not just thinking of Lytton, but also of his sister, Dorothy Strait, who wrote the lesbian novel, Olivia by Olivia, um, and James and his wife, Adi Alex, who modeled uh, an inclusive um, uh, polyamorous relationship, embracing different genders. So again, great role models, great examples, great historical uh, examples of, of positive relationships a hundred years ago, something to celebrate today. I completely agree. Thank you so much for that. I, I do think that the specificity of your, your study here gives us, it just grounds the idea that gender identity and sexuality have been flexible across history, right? But this was one particularly um, important moment of flourishing. And so that's a, a wonderful part of what the book offers to our moment. Um, I'd like to ask a little more about the writing of the book and, and particularly the genre. Um, Bloomsbury is very much known for its innovations in biographical writing with uh, Lytton Strachey's eminent Victorians, a kind of satirical um, writing about famous people and his other works as well. Virginia Woolf, of course, subtitles Orlando, a biography. So part of the intellectual work of Bloomsbury was rethinking biography. And I feel like you're doing something now that's in the that's continuing that tradition. That's really um, drawing a, a biographical portrait of a collective of these two generations. And that's not easy to do. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about genre and about writing this kind of collective biography, which is a, a kind of tough, tough decision to make. 
Yeah, well, I have to say it was incredibly daunting <laughs> to follow in the footsteps of Lytton and Virginia, as you say, who both in their very individual ways were pioneering in the way they approached biography, whether it's in Lytton's case, almost getting into this uh, mode of biofiction, essentially. So although he was rooted in historical examples, he was essentially fictionalizing their lives, whereas Virginia with Orlando was, I mean, it is fictional, it's fictionalized biography. It's a, a incredible media in its own right. And I think what gave me um, comfort through this process and through the research process was being able to um, learn more about Lytton and Virginia themselves and in the way um, that their dynamic of, of their relationship and uh, how that played through both into their own work uh, and into the way they had this uh, equally nurturing relationship with this new young a group of writers and artists, because in a sense, um, and you can you kind of see it on the cover of the book, really, you have Virginia and Lytton as these two linking characters throughout, and it's through their relationship and their relationship with others that helps to give a narrative frame to the book. Um, and just, you know, it, it, lovely, the, the, the playful way that, that, that they as writers teased each other and had this kind of mock rivalry going on um, because Virginia was jealous of Lytton's sales figures, whereas Lytton was jealous of Virginia's critical response. Um, and uh, it was, both were equally stimulated by their contact with the younger generation. Um, and that plays through into their work. And so there's a rolling theme through the book of, of how that plays out. And so with Virginia, uh, I mean, the obvious example is Orlando, um, because although the book was, was triggered, um, it, 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 sorry, was inspired by her um, uh, love of Vita, actually the idea was sparked by the premature death of Lytton Strachey's young lover, Philip Ritchie. Um, and it was in re response to the tragedy of that early death, a young man in his 20s, that she um, thought that she should write the lives of her friends during their lifetimes and create a story um, centred on a, young, a person who essentially lived forever and remained forever young. Um, and then within that character, you have somebody who is obviously an Orlando, has aspects of Vita, but equally has aspects of Vita's first cousin, Eddie. Um, and so you have this blending of two people into one, into a character that lives for hundreds of years um, and changes their gender over time. And you have um, Vita, who had a, a, um, a very masculine expression, like to dress in, in breeches and boots and has an alter ego as Julian. And Eddie, who had a very feminine expression and liked to wear taffeta and satin and eyeshadow and makeup and jewelry. Um, and how every now and then when you're seeing Orlando, you see part Eddie, part Vita, and it sort of flows in and out. Um, and then for Lytton, um, exploring his relationship with the, um, uh, the young Oxford graduate, Roger Senhaus, um, and seeing how that relationship plays through in his Elizabeth and Essex and that relationship of an older queen and a much younger lover. Um, and the sheer joy of his relationship with Roger, which he said made him feel like having doing cartwheels over the downs, what he said. Uh, and one of my favourite photographs in the book is from Lytton's albums, which are preserved at King's College, Cambridge. Um, there are images of him uh, sitting beside Roger at Hamspray, and there's a beautiful one, obviously taken by Lytton, where Roger is garlanded in lilies all around his head and lilies at his breast. And you just have such a look of love in his face. Um, and it's joyous to think of the way that Lytton helped to inspire Roger to change his life. Um, so his family wanted him to work in the city, but thanks to that Bloomsbury influence, Roger went on to be a founding publisher of Sacre and Warburg and to translate French, almost like Colette. So um, again, you have this, the structure was able to, to interrelate uh, the lives and works of old and young. Um, and hopefully to weave a story. And I have to thank my American editor in particular, who challenged me throughout um, to not just simply be listing categories and names and activities, but to be making sure there was that narrative throw flow. Yeah. Well, I, I think you, you achieved it beautifully. And 
I like the way you're describing that these two figures helped to coalesce all of these different um, younger folks and party goers. And for those of you who haven't read the book, you'll you'll get to go to a lot of wonderful parties <laughs> in the book. I also found that that um, revelation that Wolf was inspired to write Orlando out of her grief for Philip Ritchie to be very moving and, and very illuminating. And I hadn't read that before. So thank you for that insight into, into the inspiration she had, even if it was a sad one. Um, another, another very sad thing in the book was to learn that Eddie Sackville West and several of the other figures in the younger generation um, wound up undergoing treatment or conversion therapy in Germany, um, both, both psychological treatment and some physical, you know, quasi-medical treatment to convert them away from homosexuality. I was quite surprised at that. And I, I, I got the sense from the paragraphs that you write in the book that, that this had something to do with parental influence, but I'd love to hear more about why you think these young men felt the need to go do that, despite the fact that they had found this wonderful family and this wonderful supportive community for their, for their sexuality and life choices. No, I mean, it's extraordinary. Um, there's a, a very sad passage in which Lytton Strachey writes how he's, you know, sitting on the lawns at uh, Garsington Manor, Lady Ottilene Morrill's house, um, and nearly all the young men that he's looking at have, have come back, just come back from Germany from their uh, conversion therapy. Um, and almost, you know, almost more creepily than that, most of them have been introduced to Dr. Martin, who ran the conversion therapy treatment in Germany by Lady Ottilene. Uh, and he, she had actually invited him to Garsington, and you can see photographs of him on the same lawn. Um, and his treatment centre was extremely expensive. So my assumption is that their families must have paid for them to go. They were, this was mostly in the summer after they'd left Oxford. They'd all gone there together. Uh, and reading Eddie's diary accounts of the treatment is absolutely harrowing because he received several hours of what he called persuasive therapy every day, which was intensive therapy to persuade you against sexuality, uh, and then awful, uh, painful protein injections into his groin, uh, which he said were agonizing. Um, and he worried that he would never be able to write again. And this is the person who'd written his first novel while still a student. Um, and he worried that he would never be able to write again. And I thank goodness that effect wasn't there. And I think um, actually being able to have, you know, in Virginia Woolf and in Lytton Strait, she people for whom this group of young men could talk to after they'd had their therapy, hopefully helped them come out of it. Um, and I've, I draw some comparisons between what appears to have been the approach they were receiving from their biological families and the support they received from their chosen family. And what a difference that made. Yes, it's it's quite an upsetting story. And um, it, it leads me to other thoughts about the, the, the private and the public in, in, the, in the Bloomsbury world. I mean, here were all of these parties, all of these friendships, relationships, diaries, pieces of writing, some of which were published, some of which could not be published. And yet, um, publicly, uh, for example, Vita Sackville West and her husband, Harold Nicholson, went on to the BBC radio in 1929 and did a show about marriage and pre presented their own marriage as if it was a kind of model of heterosexual respectability. So publicly, there was no sense that they, they both had lovers, they had many lovers of many sexes, <laughs> and they didn't um, reveal that, and they had the privilege to have a private life that was, that was out of the public eye. So I guess I've been thinking about that, about this distinction between the private community of Bloomsbury and the public world that they moved in, and wondering where the role of advocacy comes in right, if, if at all. 
Um, there is a little bit of information that some of the Bloomsbury group members supported the World League for Sexual Reform, which was an organization started in Germany and they had an international conference in 1929 in London. Um, other than private donations, right, behind the scenes, did, did the Bloomsbury group go out there in public and advocate for changes to attitudes towards sexuality? I think the most obvious example is the way that Bloomsbury as a whole really stood behind the writer Radcliffe Hall uh, when her book, The Well of Loneliness was prosecuted for obscenity. Um, and so not only did most Bloomsbury writers sign uh, public letters of support for Radcliffe Hall, uh, several came forward to act as witnesses if they were wanted, if she wanted during the trial. And certainly uh, Vita and Virginia attended the trial and then held a, a gathering afterwards to discuss the results of the trial. So that was probably the most public example of, of Bloomsbury coming together and saying, you know, this, this is an appropriate way of sharing openly and honestly in that case about um, lesbian relationships. But you could say maybe that was the easier of the two options because obviously at that point, same-sex relationships between women were not illegal in the UK, um, but same-sex relationships between men obviously were. Um, and this was an era when um, at that you could be prosecuted if you were found wandering in the street with a powder compact in your pocket. And a young man was sentenced to three months hard labor for the crime of having a powder cop in your profit. Wide leg trousers were also suspicious. Um, and any sign of, of obviously makeup or anything on your face. And the police were prowling the streets at the bequest of the Home Secretary looking for signs of um, uh, sexual depravity. Uh, and there was a, an unfortunate young dancer called Bobby Britt um, who was arrested in Fitzroy Square. He had the bad luck to live in a basement flat so the police could peer down through his windows and they could see men dancing with men. And I think one of the reasons why most of Bloomsbury weren't arrested, I mean, you know, thinking of Virginia Woolf's party with all the young men dancing with men, is just a, a strange fact of architectural geography. If mm. you think of those tall white houses in Bloomsbury, uh, most of the large drawing rooms were on the first floor. So the parties were all taking place out of sight of the police on the street. Uh, because if they had been within sight, I think we would have seen a host of arrests. Wow. Well, thank you for that specificity. That gives us a sense of yeah. private and the public. So thank you for that. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and think a little bit more about um, artistic influence, if you would, if, if that's of interest to you. Um, I, I'm interested in how not only the older generation helped to mentor and um, help develop the younger generation, but whether there's instances of artistic influence in both directions. Absolutely. And I think one of the most um, uh, striking ways that young Bloomsbury uh, influenced older Bloomsbury was uh, introducing this group of, of writers and artists who, although they had been known before the First World War, didn't actually reach a broad audience, both in England and America, until after the First World War, until the 20s. And here they were, what they did, they interacted with this group of, of younger writers and artists who were familiar with all the new types of a media that were available in the 20s. So we're thinking here of all the um, uh, journals uh, like Vogue that were available, uh, of opportunities like um, gossip columns, broadcasting on the radio. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular of a young journalist called Raymond Mortimer, who came to the fore in the 20s. He'd probably what we would describe as a, today as a social influencer. Uh, he was working for Vogue. He met Clive Bell. Clive Bell brought him along to an evening at Bloomsbury, I think it was in 1919. Uh, and he was completely overwhelmed by meeting this group of, of older artists and writers. And he said to them, please, please, can you, can you write for Vogue? Um, I will write about you. 
And he did, he wrote wonderful art um, articles on Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant's work, on Virginia, on Lytton. So he said, I'll write about you. Can you write for me? Uh, and it was at this, this point that Virginia began describing scra uh, scraping guineas off the Vogue counter uh, because she was paying such high fees for Vogue articles and how she ended up being photographed by the in-house Vogue photographer next to a fashion shoot. Um, and these were sort of new departures reaching new audiences and um, Clive Bell in particular was delightedly then accepting invitations from all Raymond's young friends because you knew as a writer or an artist, if you were invited, just as you would be today, to high society parties, you would then feature in all the press articles that followed thereafter. And lo and behold, there was an absolute snowball of publicity uh, with beneficial results for everybody uh, across Bloomsbury. Um, and I suppose that's sort of, you know, thinking about exploiting new techniques. But if you're thinking about that, you know, young, old, benefit both ways. I think there's a couple of artistic examples, one of which is the sculptor Stephen Tomlin. Um, so uh, he, he was very much sponsored by Lytton Strachey, um, who employed him more or less as his in-house sculptor at Hamsbury, carving all sorts of things. And Tommy, he was trained by a uh, sculptor called Dobson. He produced abstract figures in the style of Gaudier Brushka, but what he's most well known today is the extraordinary portrait heads that he produced of Virginia Woolf, of Duncan Grant and Lytton Strachey. And Woolf's image is probably the most commonly used image of Woolf internationally today. Um, and so you have this sort of symbiotic relationship whereby here is a young artist producing images of an older generation that helps him progress his career, but it also goes the other way. I'm thinking particularly of Lytton Strachey. The image he produced of Strachey in 1930 was then the first image of Strachey to be presented to the Tate Gallery after Strachey's death. And as Strachey's reputation began to fade, there was his image on public display in a national collection, and therefore the two things had gone round. Um, and then also it's important to think about the influence of the young artist Stephen Tennant, who partnered with the photographer Cecil Beaton to produce some of the most iconic images of the mid 20s. Um, and one of those images um, I use on the, the, the cover of the UK edition of Young Bloomsbury and it's sort of probably one of my all time favourite pictures. Um, so taken by Cecil Beaton on the morning of the 17th of October, 1927. Um, and Stephen Tennant has assembled a group of young people in costumes. Um, and it's impossible to tell whether they're men or women. You don't know what gender anybody is. They are all dressed exactly the same. Um, and that, that afternoon, he went over to Steve Lytton Strachey, who said, I've just had a, a visit from Tennant, um, an extraordinary young man. He has a few feathers where brains should be. Um, last night they dressed up as nuns, this morning as shepherds and shepherdesses, tomorrow God knows what. Um, but these were images, Cecil Beaton's images were ubiquitous, they used in the press everywhere, they used in Vogue, they were used in newspapers, and here was a group of young people who were not afraid to express their identity in daylight. If you think Bloomsbury had had all these parties experimenting with different ways of, of dressing and performing, but that was after dark. This generation was doing it in daylight, they were being photographed and they were being published in the press. And that again is that sort of the two way nature of the relationship and the, the, the creative um, passage between the two generations. That's, that's a beautiful description of how they supported each other and how the new media really helped, you know, further everyone's career. Um, I'm also interested in, in the book and how it, in the way that it highlights the Hogarth Press, which you've already mentioned um, briefly, but maybe there's more to say there about that, but also the, the bookstore Burrell and Garnett, which I didn't really know much about until this book. And it seems like that was such a focal point for bringing people into the Bloomsbury group, group and helping to further um, you know, the aesthetic principles that they believed in and they, that they wanted to develop. So if you'd like to speak a little bit to the bookstore and the press, that would be lovely. 
Yeah, no, I wish I had had a bookstore like Beryl and Garnet to go to. Um, this was founded by uh, Bunny Garnet, who was a lover of, of Duncan Grant uh, and just about everybody you can think of in, in Bloomsbury, eventually marri marrying uh, Grant and Vanessa Bell's daughter, uh, Angelica. But in the 20s, he opened a bookshop just up the road from Gordon Square, just in the, in the road that runs off the corner, Taverton Street. Um, and so it was uniquely positioned for everybody in Bloomsbury to drop in. And he deliberately stocked uh, everything that Bloomsbury writers and artists might want to buy. So he had 18th century titles for Lytton. Uh, he would have translations of Russian authors. He would have art books. And he obviously he stocked all the Hogarth Press books he stocked um, Carrington's paintings so that you could buy both books and images. And he had Omega workshop tables on which the books were laid out and sofas strewn around the room to sit. So if you went in one day, you would, you know, might well find uh, Lytton or Virginia or Forster or anybody there chatting. Uh, and you might well be invited to a party after the book, the or notionally closed in the evening. And it was at those parties that many members of Young Bloomsbury met Old Bloomsbury because it was an opportunity to interact. And it, I, for me, it just sounds the most appealing place um, and uh, somewhere I'd, I'd love to have hung out. Yeah. I agree. Can we start <laughs> a bookstore like that? <laughs> that would be fantastic. Yeah. So it was really lovely to hear about, about that bookstore. And um, some of the figures who wandered through the bookstore were Americans. So I wondered if we could speak a little bit about the cross Atlantic connections. And particularly I was, I was noticing how your book opens with a party thrown by two American socialites that includes African American musicians. So maybe we could talk a little bit about um, influences from African-Americans on Bloomsbury or modernism and possibly the other way as well. Absolutely, no, I mean, you know, it was entirely thanks to the bookshop, Beryl and Garnet, that the uh, American heiress, who's the, I think the daughter of a Boston department store owner, Mina Kirsten, met Bunny Garnet and through Bunny, all the members of the Bloomsbury group. Now, Mina had come to London uh, in the 20s, she had been a, a professor at Smith uh, and she brought with her her student, Henrietta Bingham, who was a, a Kentucky press heiress. Uh, and the two of them, they were in love uh, and they came to England uh, in order uh, on the pretext of a break from Smith. Um, but they were sharing a, a, a home in London um, and they were both receiving psychoanalysis. Uh, Freudian psychoanalysis, which was encouraging them to explore different relationships and uh, relationships with men as well as with women. And um, by meeting uh, Bunny Garnet, certainly Mina, <laughs> that. But um, it, uh, yeah, thinking of this two-way relationship, what Henrietta and Mina were bringing to London was absolutely the cutting edge of understanding how uh, jazz music was developing in the States. Uh, and particularly a, a, um, a knowledge of African-American performers. Um, and this was the year in which Dover Street to Dixie was being performed in London. Uh, and so you had the African-American dancer Florence Mills known as the Queen of Happiness um, and uh, the uh, blues singer Edith Wilson. Um, and the book opens with uh, uh, an after show party that Henrietta and Mina threw in which they invited all the members of, of old Bloomsbury, but also the cast from Dover Street to Dixie. Uh, and they performed for and with everybody. And so you had this really dynamic introduction of the older generation of Bloomsbury writers and artists to this, you know, absolutely of the moment, uh, African-American music. Um, and you see that enthusiasm, you know, running through the group and you have Henrietta performing um, African-American spirituals at Bunny Garnet's 30th birthday party. Um, you have uh, jazz being played at those Bloomsbury evenings. Um, you have 
those themes going through into the new nightclubs in London in the 20s. Um, and you have Virginia Woolf and uh, Duncan Grant signing up as founder members of the Gargoyle nightclub, uh, which you might, you might not necessarily think of Virginia being a nightclub <laughs> attender. I'm not how, sure how often she went after dark. She certainly went there for lunch a lot uh, because it was the most amazing place. It was um, founded by Stephen Tennant's brother, David, um, and it was a converted print works um, and you took a sort of rickety metal lift up the outside and emerged right at the top of the building. And then you walked down a spiral stair into the deep blue dance floor, which had twinkling nights, lights like the night sky. Um, and then you passed through the dance floor to the dining room, which was entirely lined with gold mirrors on the advice of the artist Matisse. And there were two huge pictures of, uh, by Matisse hanging in the club one of which is now in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And again, oh, I'd have loved to have been there dancing to jazz music with um, Duncan <laughs> in the 20s. An amazing place to be. Well, you describe it well, and it does sound like an idyllic place. And I did chuckle when I read that Virginia went with Duncan Grant often for lunch rather than, <laughs> rather than during the, the evening yeah. hours. Mm -hmm. um, M mentioning Matisse, that brings us to Paris and a kind of wider um, cosmopolitan artistic community. So would you like to speak a little bit about those those connections? Um, yeah, no, well, one of the joyous discoveries of, of, of the research for the book, I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, my relation John Strachey, who had shared a flat with Eddie Sackville West in the 20s. Um, and John was uh, uh, an aesthete and a writer whose favorite thing was uh, sipping creme de menthe while wearing a red brocade dressing gown and had chocolate cake for breakfast amongst other things. Um, but he went over to America to lecture in 1928, uh, taking advantage of Lytton Strait. She just published Elizabeth and Essex. And so there was lots of popularity for that. And John Strait, she was invite, invited to lecture. And while he was in New York, he met Esther Murphy um, and he proposed to Esther Murphy, which was surprising. And even more surprisingly, she accepted him. So Esther was um, a, a, an heiress uh, to the Mark Cross Leather Goods factory. Uh, but more interestingly, she was, uh, uh, had lived for several years in Paris. Uh, she was bisexual. Previously, most of her relationships had been with women. Um, she was part of Natalie Barney's literary salon in Paris, and she was friends with that great lost generation of American artists, uh, particularly a close friend of Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. And she introduced Fitzgerald to her brother, Gerald Murphy, um, who then moved to France and, and lived on the Riviera and was the inspiration for Dick Diver in Tender is the Night. And so through John's relationship with Esther, uh, and their marriage in 1929, you get this wonderful collect connection directly between Bloomsbury and the Barney Salon in Paris, and also uh, Fitzgerald on the Riviera. And I think my kind of most exciting moment was when I, I knew that when Esther and John Strachey had their honeymoon in August 1929, they'd spent it at the Villa America at Cap d'Antibes, which was the home of, of Gerald and Sarah Murphy. And I knew that Fitzgerald had been just down the coast at the time. And I thought, did they meet while they were on honeymoon? I'd love to know. So I read his ledger. And sure enough, he talks about seeing Murphys and Strachey's that week. So yes, absolutely. Now you got direct connection, Bloomsbury, Fitzgerald. And there you go. Um, wonderful. Um, I just love to think about Bloomsbury as connected to this wider world in Paris, in the United States, in Berlin, as a kind of, as you put it at one point in the book, a queer and creative counterculture, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what this book is about. It's, it's very exciting. It sounds like we're ready to uh, do the question and answer. And if we have any time at the very end, I would love to hear about your new project, Nino. But let's hear some questions and answers before we go there. First okay, I'm going all, to read like, First of all, I'd like to just thank Loretta and Nina for a wonderful discussion, very inspiring. But I'd like to also segue off of the 
expats in, in, in Paris and the whole connection between London and Paris to talk about a matter of style and genre. Um, I'd like to know more specifically about the younger and the older generation in terms of style of writing and how they influenced each other or not. And then of course, 1922, James Joyce's Ulysses is published by Shakespeare and Company by Sylvia Beach. And I'm wondering if Joyce's writing and also Gertrude Stein's experimental writings of that time had any influence on either older or younger uh, during this period. Absolutely. Well, I'm thinking in terms of, of literary influences um, and those sort of relationships, the most obvious example is the work of Julia Strachey. And in particular, the way uh, that Virginia Woolf absolutely encouraged Julia, who was Lytton's niece, to write. Um, uh, and at that point, Julia was living in the heart of Bloomsbury in Gordon Square, number 42. Um, she's another person who's 20 in the 20s. And she talks about coming out of the house uh, every day while she was going off to do something frivolous, like buy a hat at Der Derry and Tom's, and she'd go slap bang into Virginia Woolf, who would immediately start quizzing her about, you know, how was she writing? How was she getting on? Um, and Virginia's persistence paid off uh, because even though uh, Julia was, um, as Virginia described, a typical straight she and slippery as an eel, um, she managed to prize a finished manuscript out of her um, and she published it uh, in 1932 through the Hogarth Press uh, with a cover uh, painted by Duncan Grant um, and the book was called Cheerful Weather for the Wedding. Um, and it is a, a, a really, um, in a way, it's a, a deceptive book uh, because you think, you imagine it's a, a, going to be a happy tale, but it's on with actual black sadness at its heart um, because she talks about a bride uh, preparing for her wedding, uh, getting, she's drinking and getting drunker and drunker, and then she spills ink on her wedding dress, and you know something is badly wrong. You gradually discover that the bride had been pregnant with twins the previous year, which she'd given birth to and given away. And the lover and father of her twins turns up at the wedding, but does nothing to stop her marrying the other man. And you know she's heading off into this bleak future, having abandoned her baby. So it's a, a tragedy and a comedy at the same time. Um, and Wolf uh, admired it, the critics admired it. And so I felt, you know, there you had this great supportive relationship between an older and younger writer with a successful result. Um, I'm proud of her telling that story. I've lost the thread of the question. But yeah, if I... um, also, any influences between uh, Shakespeare and Company, Sylvia Beach, and James Joyce's Ulysses? Well, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's inevitably was running through Broomsby and endlessly discussed, but Loretta would probably be better placed to answer the detail of the influence on Wolf <laughs> or not so much. Uh, but uh, I think it'd be fair to say, I, I couldn't cite direct example as younger Bloomsbury. I'm not sure that they were fully tuned in, but older Bloomsbury, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to um, just start with the questions from chat. I'm just going to begin with one, and it is, uh, a, a, said, it's less about art, it's about, it's, it's a little concrete. In 1930s from um, Ralph Samuel, and he says, in 1939, I was evacuated to Guildford and was one of the eight evacuees taken in by Mrs. St. Lowe Strachey in her home, Harrow Hills Cops at Newland Corner. Did you ever meet Ms. St. Lowe Strachey? Have you ever thought of writing about the Strachey family? Thank you, uh, Ralph Samuel. That's amazing news. What a great story. I hope I can be connected afterwards. Yeah, no, sadly, I uh, never knew Amy or um, Lytton called her Oriental Amy, which was a bit mean, I think. <laughs> like I say, she is John Strachey's mother. Um, uh, John Strachey's dad, John St. Lou Strachey, owned the Spectator magazine. Um, and he employed almost every member of the Strachey family, including Lytton, to write articles for the Spectator. Um, and they lived near Guildford um, and had a, a, initially a house that was also filled with, with Strachey artwork. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear more about that direct experience from the 30s. Sounds amazing. 
The next um, question is from M. The Bloomsbury set were cushioned, Maxine, the Bloomsbury set were cushioned by their wealth, which meant they experimented with lifestyle politics. But how progressive were they politically living through those years before and through the depression in the UK? I think probably the most overt expression of their uh, progressive political views would be in their pacifism, where they absolutely put themselves on the line uh, before the First World War, well, during the First World War as conscientious objectors uh, and in campaigning for pacifist issues throughout their lives. Um, also, in the case of women's suffrage, um, massive support amongst the female members of Bloomsbury. Um, particularly the straight she uh, sisters, but also Ray straight she um, who wrote, you know, very imp important biographies. So I think those are probably ways that, yes, they were expressing political, progressive political views. Um, and yeah, class privilege might have helped some people um, if policemen were thinking that they might be faced with expensive barristers rather than being... Um, uh, making an easy arrest. But I think if any members of Bloomsbury had been caught uh, in the or exposed in the way that Bobby Britt was, they would have been arrested, absolutely. Yeah, so I think any protection that there was would have been limited. I would also add that uh, Leonard Wolf was very involved in labor politics, um, wrote a lot of anti-imperialist work. So he was he was certainly involved in leftist politics. And of course, I'm um, talking about the older generation, the young generation, John St. Louis, I mean, John Strachey was a member of the Labour Party. Uh, he was a mar committed Marxist. Um, he became a minister in the post-war Labour government. Um, so certainly that younger generation, very much <laughs> progressive in their views. I, I, I just want to ask, do a follow-up question because um, your response about su the suffragism did um, you, you mentioned the female members of Bloomsbury were supporters? Were any? How did the male members of Bloomsbury yeah. feel about female uh, women getting getting the right to the? So my my clock is busy striking. Um, well, I think that they could be said across the board to be supportive. I think one of the things um, that members of young Bloomsbury commented on, uh, looking back their interaction with old Bloomsbury um, is how uncommon it was even in the 20s for uh, men and women to be meeting together on equal terms unchaperoned uh, because this was a period you know even when Dora Carrington when she first uh, got together with Lytton Strait she her parents were expecting her to be chaperoned in male company um, so here you have a, a group of men and women who were meeting without older supervision um, and debating with each other on equal terms regarding whether it was literature, art, politics, sexuality, philosophy, uh, and talking openly about all those topics. Because again, normally in, you were divided on gender terms as to what it was thought to be acceptable to talk about. And in Bloomsbury, young or old, there were absolutely no boundaries. Um, so you had this, this wonderful uh, sense of equality, of, of encouragement of opportunity um, and, you know, exemplified in old and young male and female. Okay, I have, I have a couple of questions from Nick. Um, can you discuss perhaps the interplay of queer gender experimentation and artistic experimentation? And the journal stuff about meeting the Murphys, et cetera, was interesting. Where do you do the archive primary source research for the book? Stuff you found that was cool but didn't get into the book. Okay, well, I was really spoiled with my archival sources uh, because um, not only was I looking at a lot of material that was still in family possession, that is both within the Strachey family and with other uh, Bloomsbury families, but also at the wealth of material that is deposited in public archives. Um, and often it was in the, the interplay between those two things, between the personal material that was still available in private hands from undiscovered material like the material at Knoll, and then matching that with the publicly available. Um, 
and oh I'm sorry I've, the, the first part of the question can you remind me because I went straight into the archives but it was can you discuss perhaps the interplay of queer gender experimentation and artistic experimentation yeah well I think you you see this throughout particularly I um, mean I'm thinking of the work of, of Stephen Tomlin and also um, Stephen Tennant uh, in the exploration of, of gender identities absolutely overtly in Tennant's work with Beaton but also it, with Stephen Tomlin and his uh, commissions um, from Lytton Strachey, which often explore um, sexual themes. So for example, one of Lytton's commissions was, um, gosh, now I'm going to forget the name. It's, it's um, the two giants, Pantagruel and the other one from Rabelais, where the giant is wiping his bottom with a goose's neck, <laughs> and that, which is, is one of the things. Uh, but also this um, exploration of uh, themes that Duncan Grant particularly follows as well, of hermaphrodites. Um, so uh, Lytton, for example, had hermaphrodite figures uh, in his bedroom. Um, and one of the active things discussed in the letters preserved by um, John and Eddie is this discussion of the meaning of hermaphrodite and how you can get, you know, what it means to be between gender or mixed genders. A question from Laura Davis. I have always admired Lytton as a wonderful wit. I remember laughing aloud when reading eminent Victorians at the description of General Gordon sitting in his tent with a Bible in one hand and a bottle of brandy in the other. What did you think of Jonathan Price's portrayal of Lytton in the film Carrington? I think Price gave an excellent performance and so much so that when uh, over the last couple of years at the Charleston Festival, um, I'm a, a trustee of the Strachey Trust, which uh, manages Lytton's copyrights and also those of James's and Alex's. Uh, and so we encouraged uh, a performative reading of Lytton's letters. Um, and in the first year, we got Jonathan to re reprise his role. Uh, and that was what I would describe as a traditional take on Lytton's letters, maybe slightly censored. Uh, and then last year we had uh, two younger, uh, no, I say last year, it was, yeah, that's my, um, two younger actors um, and really going through absolutely openly and honestly all the aspects of Lytton's um, uh, letters, including his exploration of uh, sadomasochistic fantasies and also what my child referred to as scat, which I did not so know about, but anyway, it features in the letters. <laughs> okay. And just, there's a question from George uh, Newfold. He just wants a clarification. I'm not clear what the distinction is between young Bloomsbury versus older Bloomsbury. Virginia Woolf, D.H. Lawrence, the Bells, et cetera. They are older Bloomsbury. Is that correct? Yes. So you have the, the older generation are a group of people who are mostly born in the 1880s. So they are in their 40s when we come to the 20s. Whereas the younger generation were born around 1900 or a little bit later and now 420 in their 20s. And it's the coming together of those two groups and the catalytic effect that each was having on the other is, the, is what we explore in the book. Laura Davis would also like you to remind her, please, which young man sipped creme de menthe while wearing red velvet? <laughs> that was the Mark, future Marxist politician, John Strachey. <laughs> Didn't, be, didn't believe in inherited wealth, wanted the nationalization of all industries and everything, yeah. I, I have one question, um, it's something I've always wondered. I, in reading about Bloomsbury, I often heard a comment made about um, a, specific, a particular kind of accent, particularly among the Strachies. Are there any recorded are there any any recordings of either Lytton or any of the other Strachies, Strachies at the time? Um, any recordings of their voice? Any, do you know well, of? I'd, I'd be really interested if there was a recording of, of Lytton. Someone will tell me. There are fil there's film of Lytton that Carrington took that you can watch online, but sadly it's silent. But Lytton had a typical Strachie voice. Um, male Strachies had a high-pitched voice, and that's recorded back to the 18th century. Uh, one of my relations was chaplain to George III. Um, and he said, uh, George III said, I knew, uh, I knew little straight she was coming by his squeaky voice. <laughs> you, could hear, 
a little high-pitched voice coming along. And most male stretches have high-pitched voices and Lytton did. Uh, and also they loathe physical sports of any kind, only interested in the life of the mind. And that again goes back to the 17th century. Um, so a typical straight sheet would be found lying down, reading a book. Um, uh, and as Lytton said, he couldn't lift a matchstick before breakfast. <laughs> there you go. Could you comment just briefly on um, Lytton's relationship with Dora Carrington? I mean, it was, we always, again, probably from the movie, you always think of it as the, you know, a kind of a, tri a triad, uh, Ralph Rafe Partridge, Lytton Strachey, and, and uh, Dora Carrington. So Lytton Carrington and Rafe lived as a polyamorous throuple. Um, and so they had physical relationships each with the other. Um, and what's interesting about uh, Carrington is obviously nowadays you would describe her probably as having gender dysphoria. So she was um, open to relationship with different genders, but also expressed a partly masculine identity. Um, and one again, one of the lovely things researched um, for the book, I was looking at all the letters written to Lytton by Young Bloomsbury, which are all preserved at the British Library. And amongst them are all Rafe Partridge's letters to Lytton. And what's lovely about those is here you have this strapping rower who's been fighting in the wars and he's writing um, love letters to Lytton um, and inviting him to come and shock his fellow Oxford students by talking about uh, sodomy and the Elizabethan poets and uh, reading the Fairy Queen. Uh, and then he writes a poem to Lytton after he's, they've moved in together with Carrington, which talks very eloquently about Lytton having a choice of pillows for his head. Um, and how lucky Lytton was, but, but it ends with saying how lucky I am to be your boy. Um, and I think it's a, a wonderful, you know, expression of successful polyamorous relationship. Um, well, and, and well did, did Lytton have a relationship, a physical relationship with Dora Carrington? Yeah, I did not get her, that impression. She lost, her, she lost her virginity to Lytton. I mean, it's written about in many sources. Yeah, so they had a physical relationship less often than with between the, anyway, I, mean, I can't, you can't statistically go, but they're basically, they did all have sex with each other, but in a rotational way, yeah. Well, I'm looking through the letters. Um, certainly the chat has been interesting. Um, let me see, I mean, the, I'm just trying to find, see if we have any additional, uh, any additional questions that we haven't covered. Um, if anyone sees, if there's anything and wants anyone wants to add, I am my eyes are on the chat. If you want to add it, I will read or, it. Or um, uh, Professor Steck, if you have any other comments or questions for Nino. Well, there there is a question here about Duncan Grant's abstract kinetic scroll. I'm not sure quite what the question is. Well, no, it's a comment. It's it's um. I've been working on Duncan Grant's abstract kinetic scroll at Tate, and I've been talking a lot with Simon Watney, who found it in the attic at Charleston in 1969 when he was a 19 year old student. It seems to have been such a formative experience for Simon and Duncan, such an encouraging friend. There are small areas at Charleston that Simon painted very much in Duncan's style. The support and encouragement of old Bloomsbury continued for so many decades. So I don't know if Nina wants to comment on that at all. Well, that's lovely to hear that continuing ongoing supportive role. And, and I'm just thinking, I don't know if, well, I can't say, I, I'd be, I don't know if any of you have seen, saw the uh, wonderful exhibition of Duncan Grant's erotic drawings at Charleston last year, um, which again are this lovely example of queer inheritance where Duncan passed on those drawings to one young, to a young man who passed them on to another partner, to another, and now they've been donated to Charleston and are publicly available. Um, and that's, the, again, that sense of the passing on and sharing, which is, is such a lovely legacy of this group of people. Well, thank you for that. And we can't let you go until you tell us a little bit about your next project on Monk's yeah. Well, I'm, I, it's sheer joy for me at the moment because I'm doing a research project for the National Trust on Virginia Woolf's home and collection. Uh, that's at Monk's House in Sussex. If you haven't been, I'd encourage you all to go or look at it virtually. Um, and really looking at Virginia, uh, not just as a writer, but as a patron and collector 
um, and, and a maker herself, because whenever she didn't have a pen in her hand, she had an embroidery needle and she was embroidering Vanessa Bell or Duncan Grant's designs. Um, and so looking at the, the outpouring of all that, collecting an artistic energy as well as written energy in her interiors and objects at Monk's house and unraveling some of those very personal stories. So real, real joy. Can't wait. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank uh, author Nito Stracci and Professor Loretta Steck for an inspiring conversation on this literary history and also the influence from the older to the younger generation of artists and writers and back and forth and how we carry forward uh, in, in this tradition and also literary evolution. Um, and I also wanna thank Nina for sharing her family history with us. And um, we wanna thank our audience as well and our audience from Mechanics Institute and from the Fromm Institute for Lifelong Learning for joining us. And we hope that you'll join us again at our programs here, Mechanics Institute Online. And good afternoon to everyone.